Chapter Three of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Geppetto names his puppet Pinocchio. Geppetto lived in a small ground-floor room that was only lighted from the staircase. The furniture could not have been simpler: a rickety chair, a poor bed, and a broken-down table. At the end of the room there was a fireplace with a lighted fire, but the fire was painted, and by the fire was a painted saucepan that was boiling cheerfully and sending out a cloud of smoke that looked exactly like real smoke. As soon as he reached home, Geppetto took his tools and set to work to cut out and model his puppet. "'What name shall I give him?' he said to himself. I think I will call him Pinocchio. It is a name that will bring him luck. I once knew a whole family so called. There was Pinocchio the father, Pinocchia the mother, and Pinocchi the children, and all of them did well. The richest of them was a beggar. Having found a name for his puppet, he began to work in good earnest, and he first made his hair then his forehead, and then his eyes. The eyes being finished, imagine his astonishment when he perceived that they moved and looked fixedly at him. Geppetto, seeing himself stared at by those two wooden eyes, said in an angry voice, "'Wicked wooden eyes, why do you look at me?' No one answered. He then proceeded to carve the nose, but no sooner had he made it than it began to grow, and it grew, and grew, and grew, until in a few minutes it had become an immense nose that seemed as if it would never end. Poor Geppetto tired himself out with cutting it off, but the more he cut and shortened it, the longer did that impertinent nose become. The mouth was not even complete when it began to laugh and deride him. "'Stop laughing,' said Geppetto, provoked, but he might as well have spoken to the wall. "'Stop laughing, I say,' he roared in a threatening tone. The mouth then ceased laughing, but put out its tongue as far as it would go. Geppetto, not to spoil his handiwork, pretended not to see and continued his labors. After the mouth— he fashioned the chin, then the throat, then the shoulders, the stomach, the arms, and the hands. The hands were scarcely finished when Geppetto felt his wig snatched from his head. He turned round, and what did he see? He saw his yellow wig in the puppet's hand. Pinocchio, give me back my wig instantly. But Pinocchio, instead of returning it, put it on his own head, and was in consequence nearly smothered. Geppetto, at this insolence and derisive behavior, felt sadder and more melancholy than he had ever been in his life before, and, turning to Pinocchio, he said to him, "'You young rascal, you are not yet complete, and you are already beginning to show want of respect to your father. That is bad, my boy, very bad.' and he dried a tear. The legs and the feet remained to be done. When Geppetto had finished the feet, he received a kick on the point of his nose. "'I deserve it,' he said to himself. "'I should have thought of it sooner. Now it is too late.' He then took the puppet under his arms and placed him on the floor to teach him to walk. Pinocchio's legs were stiff and he could not move, but Geppetto led him by the hand, and showed him how to put one foot before the other. When his legs became limber, Pinocchio began to walk by himself and to run about the room, until, having gone out of the house door, he jumped into the street and escaped. Poor Geppetto rushed after him, but was not able to overtake him, for that rascal Pinocchio leaped in front of him like a hare, and, knocking his wooden feet together against the pavement, made as much clatter as twenty pairs of peasants' clogs. "'Stop him! Stop him!' shouted Geppetto. But the people in the street, 
seeing a wooden puppet running like a racehorse, stood still in astonishment to look at it, and laughed and laughed. At last, as good luck would have it, a soldier arrived who, hearing the uproar, imagined that a colt had escaped from his master. Planting himself courageously with his legs apart in the middle of the road, he waited with the determined purpose of stopping him and thus preventing the chance of worse disasters. When Pinocchio, still at some distance, saw the soldier barricading the whole street, he endeavored to take him by surprise and to pass between his legs, but he failed entirely. The soldier, without disturbing himself in the least, caught him cleverly by the nose and gave him to Geppetto. Wishing to punish him, Geppetto intended to pull his ears at once, but imagine his feelings when he could not succeed in finding them. And do you know the reason? In his hurry to model him he had forgotten to make any ears. He then took him away by the collar, and as he was leading him away he said to him, shaking his head threateningly, we will go home at once, and as soon as we arrive, we will settle our accounts, never doubt it. At this information, Pinocchio threw himself on the ground, and would not take another step. In the meanwhile, a crowd of idlers and inquisitive people began to assemble and to make a ring around them. Some of them said one thing, some another. Poor puppet, said several. He is right not to wish to return home. Who knows how Geppetto, that bad old man, will beat him? And the others added maliciously, Geppetto seems a good man, but with boys he is a regular tyrant. If that poor puppet is left in his hands, he is quite capable of tearing him in pieces. It ended in so much being said and done that the soldier at last set Pinocchio at liberty and led Geppetto to prison. The poor man, not being ready with words to defend himself, cried like a calf, and as he was being led away to prison, sobbed out, <laughs> Wretched boy! And to think how I labored to make him a well-conducted puppet! But it serves me right. I should have thought of it sooner. End of chapter 3